Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a brief introduction on the Ruddam Narasimha series. Professor Ruddam Narasimha, Professor Anil Kumar, and the speaker today. So the Ruddam Narasimha Distinguished Lecture has been set up at the Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar, to honor one of India's most eminent scientists and engineers. This series has been designed as a forum for accomplished professionals and researchers to visit IIT Gandhinagar and present their work on a topical area of national importance. This lecture series is planned to address issues of energy, national security, space, infrastructure development, healthcare engineering, and other emerging areas. Today, we are organizing the sixth lecture that will address the issue of clean water. Professor Radham Narasimha's work in the area of aerospace fluid dynamics and related problems is internationally recognized. He is a fellow of the Royal Society and a foreign associate of both the US National Academy of Engineering and the US National Academy of Sciences and has served in the National Security Advisory Board and the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Prime Minister's Cabinet. His distinctions also include the Bhatnagar Prize, the Gujarmal Modi Award, the Padma Bhushan, and the Padma Vibhushan, among many others. Also, I take the opportunity to thank Professor Amrutur V. Anil Kumar for his initiative and contributions towards the institution of this lecture series. Professor Anil Kumar is an aerospace engineer on the faculty at Vanderbilt University, USA. He has been a NASA investigator of microgravity fluid flow phenomena on space shuttle flights and on the International Space Station. Today, we have the privilege of having our speaker, Professor T. Pradeep, Institute Professor Deepak Parikh, Institute Chair Professor and Professor of Chemistry, IIT Madras, for the Rotham Narasimha Distinguished Lecture. Professor Pradeep studied, studied at IISC, USC, Berkeley, and Purdue. His research interests are in molecular and nanoscale materials, and he develops instrumentation for such studies. He is an author of 382 scientific papers and over 75 patents and patent applications. In addition to the work on advanced materials, he is involved in the development of affordable technologies for drinking water purification, and some of them have been commercialized. His pesticide removal technology is estimated to have reached about 7.5 million people. Along with his associates, he has incubated two companies, and one of them has a production unit. His arsenic removal technology, approved for national implementation, has already reached about 6 lakhs people. He is a recipient of several awards, including the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, BM Birla Science Prize, National Award for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, India Nanotech Innovation Award, and JC Bose National Fellowship. He is a fellow of all science and engineering academics of India and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. He is the author of the introductory textbook, Nano, the Essentials, published by McGraw-Hill, and is one of the authors of the monograph. Nanofluids, published by Wille Interscience, and an advanced textbook, a textbook of nanoscience and nanotechnology published by McGraw-Hill. He is on the editorial boards of several journals and is an associate editor of the American Chemical Society Journal, ACS Sust Sustainable Chemistry and Engineering. He has authored popular science books in Malayalam and is the recipient of Kerala Saitya Academy Award for Knowledge in Literature. In 2015, he received the Lifetime Achievement Research Award of IIT Madras. He supports a school in his village where 500 students are on the rolls. Today, he will speak on clean water using advanced materials, science, incubation, and industry. I cordially invite Professor Pradeep to deliver his speech. It's indeed a great pleasure to come and talk to you about our science. 
how it has translated to society, how it would probably inspire tomorrow's students, students and people of India to do something new so that India will be proud. I'm glad to speak on, uh, at this occasion, on this podium, on this very distinguished lecture series. For that, I should thank Professor Anil Kumar for, for you know, introducing this particular lecture series to me and constantly pushing me uh, to, to come here and speak to you. I should also thank Uttama Lahiri for coordinating this, uh, this visit and also uh, the stimulating environment connecting me to many of you. I will be meeting more people later on. And also this wonderful, charming young ladies around uh, who have been walking with me telling me about their science. It has been a pleasure uh, being here. I will be speaking about something very dear to me, that is on, on materials connecting to clean water. Uh, before I do this, I should also tell you a few things about the person uh, who, on whom this this lecture series is named after. Well, I used to uh, interact with Professor Rodam Narasimha when I was a PhD student. But then interaction was casual, not necessarily extending to science. Later on, when I was a, on the faculty, we did this piece of work. And in this work, we showed that when carbon dioxide evaporates from water, of course, carbon dioxide concentration or vapor pressure should be constant. But then, when concentration, carbon dioxide, you know, if you start looking at the vapor pressure, when ice melts, ice gradually melts, when the ice melts, carbon dioxide concentration starts oscillating. So I wanted to know, when this concentration starts oscillating, you see, till water is, well, ice is, as ice, carbon dioxide concentration is constant or almost constant, and it gradually changes with temperature, of course, as you would expect, but when it melts, it starts oscillating. And this oscillation has frequencies. So I wanted to know, is there any connection between this oscillation and atmospheric carbon dioxide oscillations? So I went to Rodam Narasimha, although he is not an author of this. So we discussed this subject and we wrote up this paper. So it is, so I do know Rodam Narasimha from another context. So it's a great pleasure to talk uh, on this podium in a lecture series named after him. So my salutations to him. This subject is on water, our lecture is on water, a very large subject. In fact, in this planet, our blue planet, there is no subject more important than water. Over 10,000 papers get published on water each year. And many aspects of water are not understood. But one thing that is certain is that atmospheric chemistry don't produce new water. The water molecules on this planet, that number is essentially constant, something like these many liters or precisely these many molecules. We do convert water, one form of water to another, or we do, in our process of respiration, we do produce water. But it is the same water that we have synthesized or cooked in the form of carbohydrates. So we do convert water from one to the other, or we fix one form of oxygen to another, but water is essentially constant. 
this water is increasingly threatened uh, as, as we know this in very many contexts. I don't have time to tell you all those different ways by which water is getting threatened. But it is important to realize that the amount of clean water on this planet is so tiny. So in comparison to this planet Earth, which is 12,600 kilometers in diameter, this water, the total water, is very finite. And, and the clean water there is just this, but we can't use it. The real clean water that you can use is a sphere that is not shown here. It is a sphere of 56 kilometers in diameter. So it is so tiny. It is almost like a dot on uh, this kind of length scale. This water has been a subject of great debate. From a fundamental point of view, the molecule of water has been the subject of, of so many studies. And if I may pick up one person who has studied water in, in great detail, that is this person who looked at water in many ways. This is Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling, for many of you, well, is, is a person who introduced this concept of electronegativity. This person wrote this very familiar book. Many of you may not have copies of this. This is out of print these days. So this is called The Nature of the Chemical Bond. This introduced the chemical bond in its detail for those, I would like to tell you that chemical bond has, has defined the world. And we have now 9 million compounds manipulating chemical bonds in very many ways. And this book has been the most cited book of 20th century. No? It is not Harry Potter. So that is very important to know. And in this book, in one of the pages, Linus Pauling asked this question, if I know the structure of water, H2O, HOH, at this angle, this bond length, and this configuration, can I predict the entropy of ice? And he then goes on to calculate the different orientations of water, and then says that theoretical entropy of ice is this, and it is so close to experiment. And then he says, of course, if entropy of ice is known, then I can have free energy of ice. And if I have free energy of ice, every thermodynamic property of ice, therefore, I know ice from molecular structure. From structure, I understand everything about properties of materials, the macroscopic matter that you engineers are interested in. And therefore, probably, one will understand everything about material world starting from molecules. So this is a very profound statement. And if you are interested in water in greater detail, please look at Linus Pauling. Now, if you look at that large water, obviously, there are very many challenges in this. You can collect these challenges from the literature, from, from World Wide Web. And you will see that 780 million people live without clean water. Uh, more than 2 billion people worldwide rely on wells for their water. By 2025, an estimated 1.8 billion people will live in areas plagued by water scarcity. So many, so many things. But all of these are actually opportunities. Look at this. Agriculture accounts for 70% of global freshwater withdrawals. And in India, it is 67% is used for agriculture. And most of that agriculture is fed by bore wells. It is so surprising and shocking that we are depleting our groundwater resources for this agriculture. And that is 70% for global freshwater withdrawals and up to 90% in some of the fast growing economies. And what does this mean? When our population doubles, we would require more. And we will tap more, and essentially there will not be water. Is there a way by which we can grow different crops? Or is it possible, can we grow crops differently? Can we find new kinds of cooking of glucose or carbohydrates? 
can we find synthetic chemistry as a materials chemist? I'm fascinated. Is it possible if you have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, that is all that you want, a little bit of phosphorus and everything else to make uh, life? And is it possible carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, cook it, and put them in one and at one end of a reactor, and out comes biscuits. Is it possible? Is it probably necessary for us to do that? Otherwise, there is no water to make food for our growing population. So 2035, energy consumption will increase by 35%, increasing water use by 15%. Is it possible to produce energy differently? So all these are actually opportunities. So I see plenty of opportunities in the sector of water. So what did we do? We looked at materials, and at one point in time, I was asking this question, is it something that I can do with my materials for water? And that was a large theme, which took laboratory findings to market. So we have a few companies. As, uh, uh, as this introduction, uh, it, it, when I was introduced to you, I was, you, know, you were told about two companies. One of them was started by students. And Anshub was a chemical engineer, just graduated from IIT Madras. Uh, he did a three month project with me. He decided, to stay with me. But at that point in time, this company was not there. So he went to work with uh, an international company, worked for two years, and came back, quitting that job, and started this company. And Mohan Uday Shankar from Madras University joined. Amrita, another chemical engineer from IIT Madras, joined. And today, this company is probably more than about $15 million. So this is good, and we are getting revenues of the order of 25 crores. So this is a great thing. But what did this company do? This company looked at materials for clean water. So look at this product. This is a pump that is available in India. These pumps are called World Bank Mark II pumps. This is really not Mark II pump. This is an earlier version of this pump. This pump is in an arsenic affected area. And if you look at the bottom of this pump closely, you will see red stains. These red stains are because of iron oxide. And iron oxide is an indication that the water may have arsenic. Iron always comes with arsenic. And in this particular region, yes, of course, there is arsenic. And people have been living with arsenic, and we know about arsenic for 104 years, first detected in Argentina. Today we know that even at 170 nanograms per liter, so this is a very, very tiny concentration, arsenic causes DNA damage. Our country, we have put this limit of arsenic as 50 ppb, too high a concentration. The international limit is 10 parts per billion, or 10 micrograms per liter. So real limit should have been below 170 picograms per liter, uh, nanograms per liter. Uh, so you would like really to go down to picogram levels uh, of arsenic in water, but we have put it at milligram levels in water. Anyway, so this is, uh, if you have a material, and if it can remove arsenic efficiently, probably you can pack it in the form of a column, and this boy, with no additional effort, would pump water through that column and get about 300 to 400 ml of water in one stroke. A typical pump, one stroke is about two seconds, and you would like to remove this water, well, arsenic from water, in that two seconds with no additional effort. So if you are able to do that, then you can probably connect it to every pump in the villages, 
there are 2.45 million pumps in the country which are now accounted for but there are many other unaccounted pumps there may be about 5 million pumps in this country 15 percent of these pumps deliver contaminated water so this is a very large market that you have if you are in a position to do that so here we showed that yes it is possible to do at extremely high kinetics fast kinetics low pressure drop and this lasts for years together so this pump delivers 1000 liters of water per day now if you put this pump in a small school during the interval time of about 10 minutes 300 children can collect clean water from this pump so therefore we implemented this in one district of uh, west bengal called nadia district 330 pumps this was implemented of course you can implement it in very many different levels it may be 1000 liters 10000 liters 20000 liters today we have 200000 liters level implementations so this shows a way that maybe there are many other contaminants in water many other materials can be used for clean water so it is possible to have clean water using advanced materials and that became a subject theme so before we get into this the science of this we need to understand that clean water is possible on the surface of earth just because of chemistry if you take the surface of earth it contains alumina water is flowing on this alumina water is flowing on this silica water is flowing on this iron oxide water is flowing on granite all kinds of rock formations but you have clean water you have clean water because water solubility product of many of these oxides these products are in the range of 10 to the power minus 33 for aluminium hydroxide for example for iron oxide it is like 10 to the power minus 95 which means there is absolutely no solubility this is why on the surface of water earth we have only these species exposed and that is why we have clean water but i told you about the 9 million compounds that we produced many of these compounds that we produced have a very large solubility product and unfortunately in addition to those kinds of molecules even the geogenic species can have very large solubility because of atmospheric chemistry so oxygen dissolves arsenic or ars oxygen causes the dissolution of arsenic from a mineral called arsenopyrite and that gets into water uh, in certain regions when arsenic containing mineral is exposed to water along with oxygen so this is the reason for arsenic in drinking water some other regions fluoride comes into water from certain mi minerals we were not supposed to tap those or tap those regions and access those minerals we were not supposed to flow water through those minerals but because of our greed because of developmental activities we have penetrated those strata and we are in a we are in chaos today in several parts of the country why is that we are looking at nanotechnology for this uh, nano is very big very big it, it has gone into many areas but today we are looking at nanotechnology because these materials are so tiny so tiny that you can do you can extract many properties when something is tiny so let's look at why such a thing is possible so this is very similar to quantum quantum is very big we are running our mobile phones because of quantum mechanics it is again very tiny quantum is so tiny uh, and the tininess is what allows it to store data uh, many other things this is nanomaterial this is a nanoparticle called nano rod uh, we can synthesize these materials with precision today See something very interesting to know some years ago I told you about carbon hydrogen oxygen you combine it 
An organic chemist in your chemistry laboratory has to work hours together to make one molecule, right? And comes the next day, cooks this ratio in different ways, and then makes another molecule. At least one day is required per, per molecule. What is a molecule? Molecule is something you combine atoms together and give a new property. This is a molecule, right? So here is one element. You combine it in a many ways, and you get a new property. So this is almost like a new molecule, right? But with the same element, you can get a material of a different property in just another minute. Today, with nanotechnology, with one element, I can synthesize probably 100 different materials or molecules or materials with different properties in just a few hours. So this is the power of nanotechnology. So you can synthesize different materials with the same element. So look at this. Unfortunately, I don't have that picture. Somehow it disappeared. So this is, it was to say that there are very many different shapes that you can synthesize today, not just nano rods. You can have nanoparticles, triangles, prisms, many things. And these materials are called nanomaterials. Why is that? If you take a crystal of this kind, a chemist would say or a physicist would say that this is like quartz. Yes, it is looking like quartz. But if you take a corner of these and expand it, when you expand it, you find particles. So that corner was composed of particles. If you take one of these particles and expand it, you get atoms. The properties of this crystal or crystal-like object is completely different from these atoms or the element which made these atoms. Now I can make assemble these not only in the form of this crystal of quartz, but in very many different shapes, all of them will give you different properties. So this is the power of nanomaterials. With one element, you can get many properties. What are these properties? If you take a particle, such as these, which can be protected with molecules which we call ligands, and as a result of this, this shape and size, I can get many new things. What are these new? I can get new optical absorption. I can get new photoluminescence. I can get new conductivity. I can get new redox properties. I can get new catalysis. I can do supramolecular assemblies, many things. So all these are from one material which was impossible with the bulk material. So why is that we are interested in water using these materials? Because if I take a bulk material and cut it off into several nanoparticles, then I essentially increase a large surface area, meaning I can get use this large surface area for properties such as adsorption or catalysis, which would mean that more for less. For less quantity of material, I can get more functions. So this is something that people knew from the time of Berzelius. Berzelius is the person who introduced catalysis long, long ago. Incidentally, for those of you, Berzelius is the first person who wrote H2O. H2O was written by Berzelius. But H2O, incidentally, when Berzelius wrote the first stoichiometry, he wrote H square O. A two came down after 40 years later. So that is how H2O became H2O. Very interesting to know, right? Well, more for less. The second thing why nanotechnology is very interesting is for limits of contaminants. So if you look at our history, for many species that we are now regulating in drinking water, the limits have been coming down with time. So if you take, as we understand the science of a contaminant, of course the science improved further and further, permissible contaminant or this concentration decreased with time. It went on to reach limits of detection today. What does this really mean? If you take a glass of water, this glass of water is 200 ml of water. 
200 ml of water is something like 10 moles of water. One mole of water is 18 grams, 18 into whatever. So this 180 ml, so I take it as 200 ml. So this is 10 moles of water. 10 moles of water is 10 into 6 into 10 to the power 23 molecules of water, which is 10 to the power 26 into 10 to the power 24 molecules. I take it as 10 to the power 25 molecules. The limits of contamination today permissible for many species is like 10 to the power 12 molecules in that glass of water. So this is like saying that 1 out of 10 to the power 13 molecules is a contaminant that you can tolerate. 1 out of 10 to the power 13. What is 1 out of 10 to the power 13? 1 out of 10 to the power 13 is like 1 person in 10,000 Indian population. Indian population is 10 to the power 9. So 10,000 Indian population, one person is a terrorist. This is a problem. So imagine passing 10,000 Indian population through an airport entrance, and you want to remove or get rid of one terrorist, not in millions of years, but in one second. Because you want to stand in front of a water purifier and get a glass of clean water in one second. If you want to do that, then you have to have an extremely efficient molecular detection device. And that is why nanotechnology is interesting. So ultimately, the power of nanotechnology would be to recognize this one terrorist in fractions of second selectively with no cost. So that, that should be... Uh, that, that should be the limit. So let us look at the realistic or reality today. So this was the limit of arsenic in 1959, 200 parts per billion. It went down to 50 parts per billion in 1976. We understood the science. It went down to 10 parts per billion in 2001. And at least two countries want to reduce it below the detection limit of two parts per billion. So this is something the world would like eventually to do. So this is how science is advancing. Is it possible to get to these limits materials? So here is a nanomaterial which is red emitting, and it changes to green emitting with just nine ions of mercury. So what does this mean? It is indeed possible to go to extremely tiny levels of detection just as atomic levels of detection with advanced materials, which means that it is also possible to remove them. But this is one example. There are very many examples. So there are cavities, channels, imprints, assemblies, fibers, very many molecular devices. All of these are selected. And it is today possible to transport water very efficiently. So there are molecules called aquaporins which transport water like 10 to the power 9 molecules in one second. Well, very interesting. They have not come uh, to membranes today, but it is possible. But today we have graphene. Today we have molybdenum sulfide. Very many interesting new materials can selectively transport water with extremely fast kinetics. I'll show you one or two examples why this is interesting with nanomaterials. I work with a broad category of materials called metal clusters. If you look at nanomaterials, their properties change with size. Reduce the size, such as properties such as melting point decrease monotonically with size. So this is how it became very exciting from 1976 onwards. So this is melting point decrease with size. It's 1976. But people later on looked at sizes very tiny. So just about four years ago, we have been, you know, we, we came up with materials wherein properties change so discontinuously with, uh, with size. So let's say, change, look at ionization potential. Ionization potential of a species with 25 atoms may be here, with 24 atoms it is different, 23 atoms, it is different, like that. Very discontinuous change in properties. These property variations tell us that small size scale is very different. Every atom counts there. This regime is called clusters. So to, to show you why they are so exciting, 
Here is a 15 atom gold cluster. It is luminescent. So nobody thought that gold will ever become luminescent. So you would put a strip of gold and shine UV light and it will shine like red. So nobody thought that it would happen. But indeed, it indeed happens. Completely new properties come about. Today we make these materials in grams. So this is an ultraviolet light, a powder of 15 atom silver cluster, luminescent. In, this is invisible light. Today we can computationally understand this. So a structure of this species is something like that. Today we can put it into a computer and ask what are its orbitals? What are its properties? What would be its structure? What would be its catalysis? All of these can be understood. So we look at very, I'm talking about just yesterday's thing. It's just, this, is, this was in the ASAP yesterday. So this is how this world is expanding. But these materials can be synthesized. Organic chemists would synthesize molecules with precision. Likewise, a nanomaterial can be synthesized with precision. How do you know that something is precisely made? Well, you weigh it. You take a mass spectrum. So here is a mass spectrum of 25 atom gold cluster protected with some ligands. And you look at this. So here, you are looking at a molecule with its isotopic distribution with mass resolution to four decimal places. This is like high resolution mass spectrometry of a nanoparticle. Yeah? So we can do that with precision, meaning precision is to the ultimate precision of atomic complexity can be understood in great detail with nanoparticles. So this is something that I would like you to know. Nanoparticle is not just some diffuse something where how molecules are sitting there, how they are organized, how they are oriented, all of these as organic chemists would write as, you know, Fisher projection. Huh? I can do that today with these nanoparticles. So this is something very important for people to know. Not only this, I can make these into crystals. So I can orient, organize this like a, a crystal of naphthalene. I can make a nanoparticle crystal and it is luminescent. Very interesting. And I can get a mass spectrum as I told you with, with all this, this mass spectrum is composed of several peaks because of its isotopic distribution. I just told you that we can make all this complexity. What is it useful for water? So some years ago, we published a paper in a journal called Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the USA. Uh, and this journal publishes, of course, this is the only paper this journal published on water for so many years. So that's something very interesting. What did we say? We said biopolymer reinforced synthetic granular composites can be used to create affordable point of use water. Very complicated something. Think about, think about seashells. Seashells are made in water. They are made with polymers, biopolymers. They are made with soluble ingredients like calcium carbonate in water. Starting from ions, you synthesize an insoluble material with great complexity at room temperature producing no waste. Is it possible to create such materials? Strong, synthetic materials, biocompatible materials in water at room temperature. So we said it is possible. And is it possible to create such materials in such a way that I can put nanoparticles inside them? So that water will get in to that Water will get out of that, no impurity will get in there. This causes nanoparticle is so tiny and it is in this box protected with whatever <coughs> that you put in the cages. Impurities like ions can get in, but no large impurity will get in. And I'll tell you why this is very important. Ions can get in, no large impurity can get in. Water. It's a complex mixture. If you take, let us say, Ag plus Cl is equal to AgCl. Everybody writes this equation. 
But this equation in water can be influenced by 200 other equations. And that is why aqua chemistry or aquatic chemistry is complicated. So we want to know, we want to make sure that the chemistry that we are interested in would happen without the influence of other chemistries. And that is why this nanoparticle has to be protected in a cage wherein impurities can go in like ions can go in, but no complex species can go in. Now we did this, and this is this material which showed that it is, you could have such a material put dirty water and get clean water from that. You can remove all the microbes, organisms. You can get organic species removed. You can do catalysis. All that can be done. And therefore, it was featured in several places. <clears throat> Before I get into this material, I should tell you that water has 92 species regulated. 21 of these species regulated are halogenated organics. 15 species regulated are metals. 13 are organochlorine pesticides. All of these can actually be handled by nanoparticles. So I came to this realization about 15 years ago. So we showed that it is possible to degrade pesticides with drinking water uh, with, with nanoparticles. That was my first patent, and this became a product. And then uh, it went on to commercial production and all that. So in this course, subsequent years, we looked at many things. So what did we do here? <clears throat> we introduced a concept called water positive materials. So here is polystyrene. This polystyrene can be converted to beads and they will do ion exchange. But polystyrene in the process of production utilizes water. Polystyrene after it's produced in some good form, it can be used to create clean water. But after its utilization, it has to go back to nature and it will contaminate water. So if you start looking at the total water output of this, polystyrene is water negative. Is it possible to create materials which would use just one liter of water for its production and produce 1,000 liters of clean water during its utilization? So that would be a great water positive product, and that is what this is about. And it has to be water based synthesis, meaning that synthesis should happen with ions or insoluble ingredients in water. No organic solvent. It should happen at room temperature. It should be ultimately giving you water stable material so that you can fill a column, you can pass water through. So therefore, it is green. So how does it, how do you make it? So you have biopolymers, which can be very many biopolymers, and you can gradually crystallize aluminum oxyhydroxide on it, about 50 nanometers long, 50, nano, 50 nanometers wide, 15 nanometers thin sheets can be crystallized on aluminum, uh, on these biopolymer, biopolymers, and they can be assembled gradually. So here is soluble materials in water, and finally, it becomes insoluble and settles. And you can get powders. And on that, you can float water. And this is stable for years together. It will look like sand. So you can do all your civil engineering tests on it and ask what is its Young's modulus and whatever. It will resemble Ennur sand test, we, we say. So we do. So this is looking like Ennur sand. And how does it do this? Well, if you look at the microstructure, these are tiny sheets of aluminum oxyhydroxide reinforced to give you matchboxes. So think about sheets like that, but two-dimensionally they are looking like this, but three-dimensionally they are boxes. So you have all of these, and within these boxes there, is, there are cavities about 10 nanometers, and you can put nanoparticles in them. So this is nanoparticle embedded cavities. So ions can get in. Impurities will not get in. Large impurities will not get in. I'll show you, demonstrate this to you. So here is silver nanoparticles are put in, let us say. You can put many nanoparticles, here is silver nanoparticles. What happens is that silver releases silver ions in water. So you measure the silver ion concentration, this is like drug. 
it releases silver ions for you know for several hundreds and thousands of liters we run it up to 4000 liters it releases constantly 50 parts per billion why 50 parts per billion at 50 parts per billion you can kill microbes and that is a limit and you don't want to cross this this is your secondary standard of silver in drinking water but if you were to put nanoparticles regular nanoparticles they will also do this but what will happen is that in about a week's time this nanoparticle will silver ion released will decrease with time and it will no more be antimicrobial of course nanoparticles will be antimicrobial if you put particles into the into the organism which we don't want to do because toxicity issues are there ions if you release of course it will kill but no ions exist so therefore silver nanoparticle based technology dies out in real water this releases constantly and why it does not stop is because water contains calcium silicates silicates polymers in water and they go through well they are present in water but they are large they can't get into the cages so as a result you don't have uh, fouling or you don't have this silicate deposits uh, on the surface you show that with very many experiments so here is we have live bacteria and this bacteria become dead with uh, silver ions in water but real water contains dissolved solids total dissolved solids the Indian water has a lot of sol dissolved solids you ask the question does it work in such concentrations so these are large dissolved solid concentrations of relevance to drinking water to the country you put microbes at this concentration this is what you get so this works what about the ph ranges so ph range of 6.5 to 8.5 is of relevance to drinking water so you work in this window and ask it works in that window also how about humic acid or total organic carbon concentration indian waters are full of organic carbon although the limit is two parts per million we study up to 10 parts per million and you see that it works in this window also so you can go ahead and ask this question is this toxicity well silver ion toxicity or is it nanoparticle toxicity do you have nanoparticles released so we do single particle spectroscopy so here is a bacterium with which we have you know in which we have deliberately put silver particles and we can do spectroscopy on each of these particles so here is plasmon spectrum from that green particle it looks like this and the red particle it looks like this so these are the particles of course plasmon spectrum changes because of the sizes now <clears throat> this is when you put deliberately particles but with our material if you put the same bacteria the bacteria get lysed. No silver particles get in because it is all because of ionic toxicity and not because of nanoparticle toxicity. You study with very many particles. Now, <clears throat> you also ask this question does it lead to leaching? So, we have aluminium, aluminium oxyhydroxide, I told you. Does it lead to aluminium leaching? So, we do toxicity leaching protocol experiments. Aluminium concentration allowed is this much. This is what you have. Total organic carbon, of course, it is made with biopolymers. Do you have organic carbon released? This is what you have. So all this is great. So ultimately, this material can go back to soil. It does not release aluminium in soil. It does not release organic carbon in soil. It does not release it in water as well. Can you make a prototype? So here is a prototype with materials containing the silver you put water through silver ions come in bacteria get destroyed but you have other materials which can be put in here and water goes out of course bacterial debris gets removed in addition ions such as arsenic or fluoride or many others can also get removed and you can get clean water so we put in water with lots of impurities this is called synthetic challenge water and then we asked this question. Oh, unfortunately, one slide disappeared. Uh, this slide should have told you that I put in bacteria, I don't get bacteria out. I put in iron, I don't get iron out. 
I put an arsenic, I don't put arsenic out. I put lead, I don't see lead out. So I produce water with all these things removed. But then you can also put many, many other species uh, into that biopolymeric cages. So think about putting iron oxyhydroxide. Now this is a TEM, a transmission electron micrograph of that particular particle. You don't see anything. Just because the iron oxyhydroxide is very tiny and amorphous. But if you put an electron beam for some time, you see small grains start developing and expand on it. These are the tiny grains that you have. And these tiny grains are precisely iron oxyhydroxide because you can do a lot of spectroscopy to prove this thing. And they pick up arsenic specifically from drinking water, both arsenic 3 plus and arsenic 5 plus at the same efficiency. So you can go ahead and put arsenic containing water 200 parts per billion, 3 plus 100 parts per billion, 5 plus 100 parts per billion. And what do you get? You get no arsenic. And this is just about 20 grams of material put in this form, water goes in and water comes out in an anti-gravity fashion. So this is iron and arsenic containing water. Iron gives you color and what you get is clean water. And so we, five years of work, we. Come, you know, we put all of these in one paper just to make sure that people can reproduce this. Uh, and in addition, of course, you can put iron and you can do, you can produce a product. So here is a material, exactly similar kind of chemistry with biopolymer reinforced granular composites. Iron is 4,000 4, ppb or 4 ppm iron is put in. And this is what you get, you get no iron. That is the iron that you see. And arsenic 200 parts per billion you put in, this is what you see. And it is not just 100 liters or 200 liters, you run it up to 6,000 liters. 6,000 liters would mean 20 liters of water per day for a family, and so this is a domestic purifier. So in addition, we also do very many experiments to look at flow rates, whether it is kinetics is good and all that. We ask this question, how does it do this? It does it because a particular kind of structure allows arsenate ions and arsenite ions to absorb in a particular fashion. You can probe it with spectroscopy. What is shown here is Raman spectroscopy to show that ions retain their structure and don't change the structure on the adsorbate, adsorbent uh, material. We also look at many other things. For example, silver ions kill bacteria or viruses. But is it possible to reduce the silver ion concentration required for antimicrobial activity? We studied, is it possible that certain anions can reduce this? We found that carbonate, if you put in selectively, can reduce the silver ion required for antimicrobial activity. This is silver stain in a bacteria, in a, in, a, in a MS2 page. But the silver stain is increased in presence of carbonate because more silver can penetrate this virus. So instead of using 50 parts per billion of silver, today we require only 25 parts per billion because of this increased killing efficiency due to anions. So very interesting finding. So with all that, we put in a prototype in the field. So this we called it Amrit. Arsenic and metal removal by Indian technology we called it. So it's quite uh, interesting that how this Amrit came up and we put it in this, this state called West Bengal in this district called Murshidabad because there was a district collector who wanted, well, to see new technologies. So without our notice or our knowledge, he measured arsenic concentration from that device. And he monitored it for one year. We also monitored it for a year, and he was surprised that no arsenic was present in all the measurements. So we then decided to implement this uh, in several uh, places in the same district. 100 installations were made as a large scale.
field trial, and they were fantastic. This product, of course, then went on to community scale. So a typical community scale plant is about 40 cents of land, serving about 10,000 people in this community. Land, of course, is precious. Because our materials can absorb a lot of arsenic, the entire plant size reduces, and it is now from 40 cents, it is reduced to seven cents of land. So this serves the same community for the past three and a half years, it is doing that. And the water, water that we are talking about is 18 meter cube per hour of, of, of water. So we monitored it. So here is the arsenic input, and that is the arsenic output. Many places arsenic concentration varies. Of course, this is the geochemistry is such, but you have concentrations as high as these, and it goes down to this after 270 days. Of course, we monitor it every week. Today we are not monitoring it because in all water quality situations, this technology works. No, we don't have to, we can, can use it pressure as well if for increased flow rate, but we can use it in uh, gravity flow condition. Then we installed it in Nadia. I told you about the hand pump. There are several places where concentrations are low, but there are also places where concentrations can be as high as 200 parts per billion. And it works there as well. Uh, and that, this kind of studies went on. Today, we have a national approval for this technology and is being implemented. People have covered this in, in very many places. But this is not enough. It is important to take water to people. So this is our new endeavor. You have water being carried by people. There are products of this kind in the field. But is it possible that you can create new materials which can be put into a water container of this kind as women drag this water container for about a kilometer or two, water gets purified. So this is our new enterprise with a new student with Ramesh Kumar Soni, and that is a material, several materials, which gradually clean up water during the roll, which we call roll pure. Now, what is its, what are the immediate plans? The pump is connected to this kind of a device. Is it possible to sense arsenic uh, in the water and send it to cloud and have a water map, water quality map of the country? So we are today having water purifiers with remotely operated sensors with data going to the cloud. And this is something very interesting and it is it can be implemented on domestic water purifiers our next level or next generation of water purifiers have that. I will be talking about that in a few minutes. So what are these sensors? So these sensors are biosensors. So this is arsenite oxidase, which oxidizes arsenite to arsenate. In that process, two electrons come out and you sense that by electrochemistry. We use normally an electron transfer mediator, typically a protein, but instead we can use nanomaterials for direct electron transfer. And with that, we can improve the collection efficiency. We can go down to better detection limits. We would like to have devices of this kind. A prototype is currently undergoing testing. Is it possible to have visual sensors? I showed you that clusters are luminescent. But is it possible to have such clusters put on paper? Luminescent, and today, they can be electrospun. These are tiny fibers on which such clusters are put, and the whole thing is luminescent, but really, in white light, the concentration is so tiny, there is no change in color of this membrane. But it changes color with tiny amounts of contaminants. So here is the contaminant of mercury. It changes color in just that much of time. It is very sensitive. Just about 80 ions of mercury changes this concept, you know, color. You can also use in different contexts, very many different materials for different sensors. Here is the other thing that we are looking at. So here is, uh, here are some fibers which we are growing in air. These are metal fibers growing in air from silver and these fibers can capture water. 
So these are just like fibers on, or on thorns on cacti, and we have made them super hydrophobic. And when they are super hydrophobic, oh, unfortunately, this went off again. Can I? Hmm? Yeah, here. I can't see this. So what you see went off again. Well, anyway, unfortunately, I can't show you. This was all coming, but it is not coming now for some reason. But I'm sorry about that. So you can see that these fibers capture water. And ultimately, we would like to have atmospheric water harvesting. And we have today a prototype which harvests water, 50 liters of water per square meter of those fibers, and in one day, at an atmospheric relative humidity of about 52%. So it's fantastic. Is it possible to have devices of very many devices of this kind Today we are looking at another kind of technology called capacitive deionization, wherein we pass ions, ion containing water between electrodes, and then we get sweet water from saline water. So this is our new company, and it has produced this product, and you will have this in October in your kitchen. So this is something that is coming up very soon, and it works with just 1.2 volts of electricity or potential, which means that you can run this on photovoltaics. We would like to have natural calamity prevention. So here is new material using which we would like to have geospecific water purifier bottle, especially when Brahmaputra floods. When arsenic is there in that water, is it possible to create something of this kind? So science of this kind, obviously, becomes possible with an institution, only with, possible with a great institution. So I am fortunate to have my great institution backing me. This is the first slide of Bhaskar Ramurthy's uh, presentation, a great place. Uh, among people, well, apart from people, we also have other inhabitants on the campus. Fantastic place. And these are my former students who built a company. This is Anshup, this is Uday Shankar, this is Amrita, they are all owners of this company. Kamalesh is a scientist in the same company today after his PhD. And uh, this man, Shihab, is a professor in a new IIT. Uh, and this girl is doing her PhD in Germany. This boy is continuing with me, wanting to do a PhD. So this is how this water team, the first company's water team uh, is. And of course, this has received a lot of attention uh, globally. Uh, chemistry community has recognized it. Our science is very big. Lot of people, lot many activities. This group is about 55 plus. So I showed you the science of a few people. And to do this science, our institution has built a new center. So this is our new center on water, and it is a fantastic ambience, uh, great place to work. Uh, and I also should tell you that what we have tried to attempt is a very tiny thing. Every problem, of course, when you look at this large problem of water, every problem is dwarfed in front of this giant water crisis. So India course, faces water challenges because India is the most populous country uh, and water stresses in quantity and quality is felt by populous countries. Therefore, India is at the center of action. So many of the problems of water quality can actually be handled affordably with new technologies. I have shown you that arsenic can be handled. Similarly, fluoride and mercury and pesticides can be handled affordably accessibly and reliably.
here in this country itself. Ultimately, the satisfaction for a scientist is to see when something is in action. So this is an installation in a school, but it also tells you that when we are unable to give clean water to our children, our nation loses future. With arsenic in water, you are making our people destined to face a, 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 what I would say is a blunt future. Their IQ is, their growth is retarded. Their potential is reduced. And we are subjecting our people to torture. And therefore, it is important for us to give clean water to our children. This science, I take money only from one funding agency called the Department of Science and Technology. And that agency has been immensely supportive of our science. So thank you for this, uh, this time. And I will take questions. Before I do this, I would show you a tiny movie of 1 minute 43 seconds, which CNN shot to say that this technology might possibly have something for the future. I hope this will play now. It's essential for humans to survive, and yet a tenth of the world's population doesn't have access to clean water. Instead, water sources are contaminated with harmful bacteria, viruses, and toxins, like lead and arsenic, claiming millions of lives every year. Thalapil Pradeep, a chemistry professor at the Indian Institute of Technology and his team of bioengineers may have found a solution, a $16 nanoparticle filtration system that the team says can both remove chemical contaminants and kill microbes. Dr. Pradeep's filter uses silver nanoparticles that have antimicrobial properties. They're housed in a specially crafted filter made of aluminum and chitosan, which comes from the shell of crustaceans. As water flows through the filter, the nanoparticles become oxidized and then release silver ions into the water, killing contaminants. And the production of the filters requires no electricity. Dr. Pradeep and team say one filter could provide a family of five with clean water for an entire year. Some members of the scientific community have expressed concern over the efficacy of the technology in places like Africa and India, where keeping the filter clean could prove to be a challenge. But Dr. Pradeep is pushing forward with the technology, using larger filters in communities throughout India, and he hopes to reach 300,000 people by the end of the year. When it comes to clean water solutions, instead of thinking big, it's time to think nanotech. This was uh, several, three years ago. We have reached many more people. We have expanded our technology. Thank you very much.